Hello and welcome to My PGCE, a podcast documenting my journey as a trainee teacher with a special focus on mental health. I am your host, James B. Good morning. It's been two weeks since I last recorded an episode, and in that time a fair amount has transpired. Now, In the last episode, I said that the format going forward would be looking at how I'd met my targets in the previous week, and then looking at what my targets would be for the following week. I've since decided that I'm trying to impose too much structure on this podcast. I think I also make the same mistake with a fair few, if not all of my lessons. Sometimes I try to impose too much structure on them and I end up not being as flexible or adaptive or responsive as I should be. So today in the podcast, and I think from now on, I'm just going to sit down and I'm going to talk about what I think was interesting from the past week. In this case, two weeks. So first of all, I want to talk about two formative experiences from the past two weeks. These are two experiences where I think I've learned a lot about myself as a teacher. The first was a lesson where several things went wrong and I was all on my own. So, I was with my Year 7 class. In the previous lesson, I had introduced a new seating plan. There had been several protests, but quite quickly they all moved to their new seats. I should give a little bit of background on this class. First, they're one of the bottom sets, yet there is quite a wide range of abilities. There are also several characters in the class. Anyone who has any experience as a teacher will know what that means. And so, this class is or can be challenging, but it's great for me as a trainee teacher because it gives me lots of opportunities to learn. So, like I said, I introduced this new seating plan, and that was in response to the previous lesson, which had been a difficult lesson in terms of behaviour. So I introduced a new seating plan. I think also a few of the characters had been told off after that badly behaved lesson by their form tutors. So when I first introduced a new seating plan, it went down okay bit of resistance at the beginning but on the whole it was fine but then in the next lesson it was almost like they had collectively agreed to stage a revolt a protest over this seating plan the usual characters were um, digging their heels in but so were some students who are usually perfectly well behaved while this was happening the exercise books seemed to have disappeared. So the students who were sat down in their new seats, I couldn't even get them started with the starter. So I was trying to put out two separate fires at once. And there was a moment where I was looking for the exercise books and I had several students in my ear arguing over the new seating plan and I thought I don't know what I'm going to do here like I think I feel like I'm in over my head and like I said I wasn't being observed in this lesson it was my first lesson on my own there'd just been a mix-up so sometimes my mentor observes me sometimes the head of department observes me and I think they each thought the other one was observing me so it's just an easy mistake to make And at one point I was thinking, shall I run back upstairs to the the maths classrooms and try and find someone to give me some support? But at the same time, I was thinking I can't leave this class unattended. So I 
I stuck with it. I set several students the task of finding the exercise books and getting them distributed. Um, and they did a great job. They saved me, actually, those two boys, I think. They found the exercise books, got them given out, which meant that I could deal with the students who didn't want to sit in their new seats. And I made no compromises whatsoever. I dug my heels in. And sure enough, after a good amount of time, I'd say it was maybe 15 minutes or more into this lesson, they did all sit down. They all had their exercise books. They all got on with the starter. And then the lesson to follow was actually, I think, one of the best I've done. And it's always so difficult to analyse why that might be the case. If you have a good lesson or if you have a bad lesson, sometimes it's just so hard to figure out why. And you really want to figure out why, because if you know why, you can then try to rep replicate those conditions going forward. I don't know whether it was something to do with the fact that I had dug my heels in over the seating plan and not allowed anyone to swap seats. So in that particular battle of wills, like me versus them, I came out triumphant. So maybe that made them more compliant for the remainder of the lesson, possibly. Or maybe my explanations of that day's topic, it was something to do with fractions, equivalent fractions, maybe. Maybe my explanation that day had just been a bit better so that they could access the task more easily and therefore produce more work. I don't know what it was, but yes, that lesson had a very rocky start where I was thinking, I don't know how I'm going to deal with this. What am I going to do here? I'm in over my head. But I persevered and it turned out really well, I think. So the reason I think this is an especially formative experience for me as a trainee teacher um, is that when I first met this class, like I said, they present a host of different challenges. I remember thinking, how on earth would I deal with this class by myself? Because I always had support in the classroom from the teacher who was observing me. But then on this occasion, I was well and truly thrown in at the deep end. And I didn't drown. There was a moment at the start where I felt like I was drowning, but I stuck with it and pulled through and I proved to myself that I am capable of managing a class like that and I can on my own get them to learn something. So that was a confidence booster. The next formative experience that I've had in the last couple of weeks, it was a couple of days ago actually, um, it was my first I'm not going to say full day of teaching, but almost full day of teaching. I taught four lessons, periods one to four. And I was also especially tired that day. It was a Thursday and the evening before, the Wednesday evening, I decided to go for a 5k run, which is something I haven't done for quite a long time. And the following day, the Thursday, when I was teaching four lessons back to back, I was exhausted. Yeah, so not only was it my longest day teaching, I also woke up that day feeling very, very tired. So, but I pulled through and the first three lessons in particular, I thought were pretty good by my standard. So when I say I think I've delivered a good lesson, I'm measuring that by my own standard. So I kind of have in mind the best lessons that I think I've taught so far and I measure each subsequent lesson by that standard. So I thought, thought the first three were pretty good. The fourth one wasn't so good. I botched my explanation of solving equations with unknowns on both sides. Uh, but the teacher observing thankfully stepped in and offered a different explanation, one that was closer to what they'd already been learning. In fact, what I'd already been teaching them that week which they could access more easily and then have more success with the tasks. So I'm really grateful for that intervention because it got the lesson back on track. But yeah, so I had four lessons in a single day, which is the sort of day I'll have when I'm an ECT next year, an early 
career teacher um, and also when I am a, a full-blown, fully-fledged teacher after that. So yeah, just like with the challenging class that I thought I would never be able to handle on my own, but then did, on this day when I had four lessons back-to-back, there was a time only a month or so ago, a couple of months ago maybe, where I thought, how on earth will I ever do four or five lessons in a day? Like one lesson would take it out of me and I'd feel like a zombie afterwards. And after four lessons on Thursday, sure enough, I did feel like a zombie, but I still managed it. I pulled through. Yes, I was tired. I went to bed early that night, but it was all fine. I managed it. And I now look forward to taking on the challenge of just more lessons. In fact, that was the first thing my mentor said to me when I told him that I'd managed to do four lessons in a day. He said, okay, well, we'll have to build you up to five now. But having done four, again, my confidence has, has been boosted. The progression and escalation of my of my teaching timetable and the sort and generally the sorts of experiences I'm having as a trainee teacher seems perfect at the moment. I'm certainly being challenged. I'm right on the edge of my comfort no no actually I was gonna say I was on the edge of my comfort zone. I'm well beyond my comfort zone, but I'm not into complete chaos. I'm in that Goldilocks zone between comfort and chaos where I am learning and growing and progressing. So yes, I was very happy with those two experiences this week. Okay, so now I'm going to put two questions to you, which I thought were interesting, questions which have arisen in the past couple of weeks. And then at the end, as usual, I'll talk about my mental health. So the first one is, is respect transitive? Okay, so what does transitive mean? Unless you're into mathematics, it may not be a word that you've encountered. It doesn't seem to appear very often elsewhere. And I'm going to read the maths definition off Google. Okay, so it applies to a relationship. So if a relationship applies between successive members of a sequence, it must also apply between any two members taken in order. What on earth does that mean? Okay, here's an example. If A is bigger than B, and B is bigger than C, then A is bigger than C. Okay? Again, that's still pretty abstract. So, if Ben was taller than Mary, And if Mary was taller than Sarah, then Ben is taller than Sarah, okay? So being taller here is a transitive relationship, okay? Now, what was my question? My question was, is respect a transitive relationship? So this came up at some point in the past couple of weeks. I can't exactly remember when. But... If you've got a class, or if you've got individual students, say, who don't really respect you as a teacher, but they respect another teacher, if they see that other teacher showing you respect, will they then respect you? That's the question. Is respect a transitive relationship? Would that work? And I think the suggestion, I think it came up at university, The suggestion was that it would work, like this is a good strategy in order to build relationships with your students. Let them see you interacting with teachers they already have positive relationships with. So you can almost piggyback on other teachers' relationships with students. I can imagine that that would be a good way to get your relationships up and running, off the ground. But I thought it was an interesting question. It certainly does seem like it would be a good strategy. So let me know what you think. Is respect a transitive relationship? Does it work like that? Okay, here's another question. At my school, in response to 
poor behavior, we have this consequence system. C1, C2, C3, C4. C1 is a warning. C2 is a 15-minute detention at break or lunchtime. C3 is a half an hour detention at lunchtime or after school with potentially a phone call home. And C4, I think is, so it's definitely an hour's detention after school, phone call home, and I think exclusion from the lesson. But I'm not sure about that last bit. But anyway, I'd imagine lots of schools with robust behavior systems may have something similar. So the conversation I had with a teacher in the past couple of weeks, computer science teacher, was about whether you should escalate through your consequences quickly at the start of a lesson. So if you have a student who's coming to your lesson, is being very disruptive right from the beginning, should you escalate them quickly through the consequences? C1, C2, C3. Now. I think it's a bit of a dilemma because one problem, which I've heard students themselves say, is that, well, if I've already got a half an hour detention, if I'm already in trouble, then what incentive do I have to behave for the rest of this lesson? You know, I, might, I might as well just kick off even more and then leave. I might as well not be here. Now, the solution, or at least a candidate solution, to that way of thinking is to give the student hope of reprieve. So they may already be on a C3, that's a half an hour detention at lunchtime or after school with potentially a phone call home. But if the student believes that if they behave for the remainder of the lesson, there could be a de escalation, the teacher might knock it down to a C2. If you give them hope, if they have hope, then that may incentivize them to behave for the remainder of the lesson. And I'm starting to see now how hope can be an incredibly powerful tool for manipulating behavior, which is almost a bit worrying. But there is potentially a problem with that. This is the second horn of the dilemma. So if you've given a student a C3, say, in the first couple of minutes of the lesson, and then they behave for much of the remainder of the lesson. If you knock it down to a C2, does that kind of show some sort of weakness? Does that take the clout out of having a C3 to begin with? And that's why I think it's a bit of a dilemma. Because if you escalate too far too soon, then the student perhaps loses, loses any incentive to behave for the rest of the lesson. But if they know that if they do behave, things could be de-escalated, then does that show weakness on your part as the teacher? Or does it just make you seem like a just teacher? I don't know. So yes, another interesting question. Please let me know your thoughts. Now, the final thing I'm going to talk about, as usual, is my mental health. It's been good. Again, it's almost like I've been too busy to have any mental health problems, but that wouldn't be the right thing to say because there have been other times in my life where I've been especially busy but still suffered with mental health problems. The difference here is that I'm busy with something that I believe is very important and can help me grow as a person. That's what matters. Again, I've said it lots of times, it's almost the it's almost a recurring theme in this podcast by now. I think it's the sense of purpose of being a teacher that holds mental health problems at bay. Having such a strong sense of purpose, a fire that burns so bright, there are no shadows left in which anxiety or depression can lurk unseen. That said, when you are incredibly busy, and you have lots to do all the time. If ever you find yourself at a loose end with nothing to do for a moment, that in itself can be anxiety inducing. It's almost like you've developed some sort of dependency upon your productivity. 
And if for a moment, as I had yesterday morning, I'd done everything I needed to do for that day, I didn't have enough time really to do any work on a university essay. This was, this was during a free period yesterday morning. I'd done everything I needed to do to prepare for the day. Like I said, there wasn't enough time really to start anything else. And so I kind of had 20 minutes or half an hour where I was kind of like tapping my fingers, looking around anxiously for for something to do. And I was thinking, I, I must have something to do. And that in itself induced a bit of anxiety. And it's something I'd like to keep a close eye on moving forward because it's really important to be able to take those moments when you don't have anything to do, few and far in between though they may be, when they do happen, I think they should be relished. You should take a moment just to have a cup of tea, read a book, talk to a colleague, chill out basically. Now, I, I think I'm quite good at resting. In the evening when I come home from school, weekday evenings, once I'm home from school, I'm then resting. I do do some work at the weekends. I do most of my lesson planning at the weekends on a Sunday morning so that I can have my evenings free. And I prefer that. So some of the other trainees and maybe some of the teachers, I'm sure, do lesson planning in the evening. So Monday to Friday, they are kind of working all day, but then they have their weekends. So they kind of do a lot of work in five days and then have a lot of rest in two. I think I prefer to do some extra work at the weekend, but then ensure that each and every day of the week, whether it's weekend or weekday, I have some rest in the evening. I think that's better than having all of your rest in one chunk at the end of the week. Better for me anyway. So yes, I am good at resting. But what happened on this occasion yesterday was that it was at at a time of day when I wouldn't normally be resting. I wouldn't normally have an opportunity to chill out. Yet I did. I found myself at a loose end. And so yes, that did cause a bit of anxiety because I thought I must be forgetting something. It's just so unlikely that this moment of peace would occur. So unlikely that I just must be forgetting something. So that was a bit anxiety inducing. But should such moments occur in the future, I'll do my best just to take them for what they are and not start doubting myself and thinking, yo, you must have forgotten something. Have a little more trust in myself that no, I have done everything and just take this moment to chill out. That's what I'll try to do in the future. I hope you've had a good week. I may not talk to you next week because my partner is visiting, but I will certainly talk to you the week after. If you like the episode, please spread the word in person and on social media. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at mypgcepod or email mypgcepod at gmail.com. Please subscribe, rate and review in your directory of choice. Please also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash mypgcepod and helping fund both the podcast and my PGCE course. Thank you and talk again soon.